Well, thanks very much for being here. This is really kind of a, an exciting session, I think, from a couple perspectives. One is, sometimes when you go to an anniversary, a lot of time is spent on an event. I think the, uh, the kind of old saying I kind of like is that if you don't know where you're headed, then where you've been probably didn't matter. And I think what we're really looking at today is where are we moving ahead? How are we moving ahead? Building on what's been done in the past. So I'd like you to um, kind of have this or approach this session from that perspective. And I think Neil Hollis' session was was really great, and it um, pretty much set up the tone for the kind of things that, that we want to do here. Essentially, uh, rather than doing long introductions for our speakers, uh, you have their bios in your your brochure. So I'll introduce who they are, but you know to figure out what kind of things they've done in the past. But well, you can probably just refer to that. So uh, let's take a look here. The uh, Center for Governmental Studies operates in teams, and so we have a team on economic development, and uh, the people there are listed. I think some of them there, Mim is in the back, she can, can raise her hand and can see her, I'm not sure, Andy was here, I don't know if he's here, but there he is, she's around, I'm not sure Brian Harker's here. Anyhow, so this was a situation of age before ability, so basically I got to, to do this job. So that's where we are. Okay, we have some objectives here for this session that I think um, I'd like to share with you. One of the things is that we're trying to understand two major issues, or try to deal with two major issues. One of them is technology. Technology is changing in such a way that it's benefiting information-based industries. As a result, those industries tend to be located in large urban centers, larger urban centers. And they have agglomeration economies and these kinds of things. The output or the outcome of that migration or a pattern will be that the larger centers are going to probably grow faster as they have been and they're probably going to draw people out of the rural areas, especially those with high level talent. So we have to deal with that issue. The second issue is that we're dealing with population declines over the next 15 to 20 years. And Neil talked about that a bit and you'll see some slides here in just a second. So, what this is doing is it's creating a situation where you've got growth, most growth, in the larger centers. You have then regional hubs that are, are basically serving those centers, as suppliers, and so forth. But those regional hubs are also driving the rural area. And so the session today, we're going to talk about what is technology doing, where is it headed. We're going to talk about how can the uh, public officials use that technology. We're also going to talk about regional hubs with an example of Dixon. And we're going to talk about what kind of resources do we have coming in. And fortunately, Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity just released a five-year state plan. So essentially, we're going to then hear about those kinds of things as well. So we um, essentially, we're really trying to gain some new insights. But th the big focus here, I think, should be on implementing locally. And that's really what you're to do. And in that vein, I'm a big strategic doing kind of person. So as a result, we've made some sheets available to you for your to use notes. And essentially it asks, what kind of things could I do when I get home? What would I be trying to do? Who would help me do it? What are our objectives? So if you choose to, to do these things and take notes as you go home, I think tomorrow morning or next week, you can pull this out and say, yeah, you know, this is what I thought at that time. If you're like me, you tend to just you know forget your notes and everything else. So, our presenters are Mark Thornton, who's executive director of the Regional Technology Services in NIU. He's going to talk about local government technology, and then Danny Langloss is the city manager and council, and along with Councilman Mike Clear, the city of uh, Dixon, are going to talk about what kind of changes creating, how can they create thriving communities, and these are really the regional hubs that we talked about. And then Agnes Masnick is going to talk about the five-year economic development plan and the resources that we'll have to work with for the next uh, period of time. I want to start just for a second here to kind of lay the groundwork so where we are. You heard about Neil's discussion and the kind of things that, that are going to happen. But this is what we're looking at for the northern Illinois region. Now this is north of Route 80, east of the uh, Mississippi River, not including Cook County, but the suburbs and in south of Wisconsin. Now we have this kind of information available in a, a handout that you can pick up, both in the one we did here that you probably have seen or, or will see, and then there's also a policy profile. So both of them sort of address these, these regions. 
But the thing that I think you want to pay some attention to, essentially, is this group. Because if you look at 20 to 29, 29 to 2019 to 2029, essentially, this is where our growth is going to be. And like it or not, this is where our growth is going to be. <laughs> so I think we have to, as we plan ahead for the next 10 years, figure out how are we going to accommodate this kind of change, along with the, the technology changes that I just mentioned in terms of how they're going to distribute uh, employment. So this is a, kind of an interesting and kind of sobering thought. But, and I don't see this at all as negative. I just see it as fact. It's a question if we deal with it and we move ahead. Uh, so you compete in a couple of, or complete a couple of things here in the session. One is the strategic planning matrix I just showed you. The second one was we have a shape the future cards that you received, a postcard as you came in. We'd like you to fill those out, tell us about what kind of themes are going on in the region. We would like then in a follow up to get back, organize some groups perhaps, see what the uh, future really looks like as far as you're concerned, and then try to help in some way, CGS help in some way to, uh, to do it. And the last thing I would leave you with is, um, I think above all, in my experience, is that you want to think big, you want to have fun, and you want to celebrate successes. And I think that's really what, um, what this is all about. And so we'll, uh, we'll start with that, so keep that in mind. So let me change this if I can to the next speaker. And we go. Where is that matrix you referred to? I'm sorry? I don't know that I have the matrix. I'm oh, the matrix. Uh, do you want to hand out to the matrix? Yeah. Mary can, can show you. Not everybody's going to want to do this, but those of you who do, I think it's kind of a useful technique. Okay, so here's Mark Dorsen. For the opportunity to be here and, and talk with you a little bit about um, sneak peek into the future of what local government has in store as far as technology goes. Um, this was sort of a challenging uh, thing to build because honestly I could kind of go on for quite a while and I had to cut out quite a few topics that I thought were, were just as important and uh, try to get to some of the things that were more, most influential as best I could. Um, and the truth is, is I looked at it from the standpoint of maybe a five to ten year window. And the truth is, in technology, five years is an eternity. It's a life cycle for quite a bit of what we do. And uh, I, I do have a bit of a disclaimer that all of this is subject to the next disruptive technology that occurs, could be tomorrow, that will uh, completely change and alter everything that I'm telling you at this point. But uh, based on some of the trends that we've had from uh, over time, these were some of the areas that I felt were the most impactful as far as local government goes. And being able to provide uh, as best as it can to its community. So starting out with security, moving into uh, the cloud, what is it? Uh, I'll give a little bit of uh, more information so we, so we all have a sort of a baseline understanding. Um, what is smart? But smart is actually maturing as it, as it moves along. Automation and artificial intelligence and how that's going to start to permeate its way into local government and uh, Connectivity and I'm going to wrap it up with probably one of the more difficult topics Which is uh, data privacy and ethics and what role that plays in local government and what role it could play uh, moving forward So starting out with security. I think that's probably top of mind for quite a quite a few organizations. I know um, I've, I've been in local government IT for over 20 years and it's things that kept me up at night as far as um, how are we being able to uh, work through problems and, um, and keep systems available and protect systems and data. And one of the things I will tell you and most security professionals will tell you is we have to walk into security not with the mindset of securing our systems, but how do we defend our systems. Because that's truly what security, security professionals do. And that mindset is slowly starting to change to how do we defend our networks. And I will tell you that um, and uh, it, it is about technology, but I purposefully put technology last on this list. Because there are some things you can do 
that don't require a heavy investment of, of, of capital outside of resources in terms of time. Um, and, and one of those is just the foundational work of a good, of a good operating environment. Making sure that you, you patch your systems, making sure that you have antivirus. It's not going out of style, I don't care what headlines say. It is definitely very much necessary as much as it is, as was yesterday, as it will be tomorrow. Um, uh, making sure that you have a, uh, a, a good policy program in place, making sure that you adhere to that policy, you enforce those policies. Um, these are just fundamental things that, take, that need to take place in an organization and will ultimately start to lower your risk level and will help you defend your network better. Moving into to user awareness is another fundamental step towards defending your network better. Making sure all of the users, all the employees, and even the public to an extent is educated on how to protect themselves and how to protect the networks that are involved. You can put all of the next generation, you know, blockchain enabled, you know, pick your buzzword and marketing term for, for all of these things in place and it can still be circumvented by one of, uh, one of your employees by a mistaken click. It's that easy to do, and that's where that user awareness training is, is extremely critical. And then finally with the technology, that's when you start to supplement your, uh, your, your, um, your work that you've done fundamentally in your organization with the technology that will help assist it. But if you don't do the fundamental work first, all the technology in the world is just going to be is equal to a paperweight at that point. I don't see security going away as a problem. I think systems will be a little bit more hardened as we move along. I think systems are better designed and better enabled as we move forward, but I don't think the, uh, the threat of ransomware and other types of, uh, of malicious attacks are, are, are going to diminish. And that's an area that um, the local government needs to be aware of. The cloud. Um, it's not exactly a brand new term. It's been around for a while. It has matured considerably. What has happened is the adoption in local government. And anecdotally talking with colleagues, we are starting to, to penetrate more and more into what ideas we can move into a remote system. And that's really what the cloud is for those that may not, they hear this word and they don't really, they can't really picture exactly what that means. It really means it's someone else's computer. Someone else is managing that, someone else is taking care of it for you, all you're doing is accessing whatever systems are presented to you. Um, when you hear pro public versus private cloud, we're starting to see this at a state level right now. I think it will probably start making its way down to local government a little bit more, but the state is starting to step away from uh, this cloud first initiative and look at it more of where does it make sense to put it in here and where can I use that remote rental system, that, that operating expenditure versus a capital expenditure of buying the equipment myself and seeing where those types of things make sense. So I'm seeing a, a cloud adoption increasing with local government. I'm seeing it from re what I'm reading in uh, NASIO, the National Association of state CIOs, um, they're showing that it's more tapering off as, uh, in terms of their adoption and, and their methodologies for using it. Um, moving into smart, and, and smart has been one of those ambiguous terms that, that gets thrown around and everyone wants to be smart, but what does it mean to be smart? We, we, we still struggle with this. I'm seeing that it's starting to mature a little bit from let's throw sensors in the ground just because to, well, why do we need this? And what does it make sense to do? And how can we leverage the information, the data we're collecting to better serve our, our citizens? And I'll tell you that there's a want for this. Um, judging off of a, a government um, institute, governing institute survey, 80% of citizens want a better customer experience. 52% of citizens say that the digital government is falling short of their expectations. Let me be clear, we have a high bar set for us. It's not that we're setting it. The private sector is setting that bar. Now the expectation is starting to be met. And, and, and from a citizen perspective, it seems, uh, judging by this information, they don't really care that you're not a, a private sector company. They still expect to be able to operate in that same modality that, they, that they've been accustomed to. 
So I've gleaned this from a couple of different strategic plans from communities, and I thought there were some really good highlights from this. Um, building a foundation is a good idea. Start somewhere. Look internally first. See how your operation goes. Are you, are you mostly digital, or do you still heavily rely on paper processes? These are the types of things that if you want to dive into that digital and transparent economy and, and, and dive into that world, you need to have your, your, um, your systems more enabled. Having establishing success metrics, you know, if you, if you don't know what success looks like, it's going to be difficult to determine if you actually got there. Um, tying it to economic development goals, and I think this is key because as CIOs now, we're no longer really the techie people that are just there to, to make sure systems are running. We really are now moving into a role of, of um, brokering systems and brokering solutions to be able to help economic development, um, help regional development, help your CDBG and, and other community development efforts to be able to um, provide solutions that make sense and, and, and move you in the right direction. I, I'm, I'm really learned over the years, you can't do this alone. You have to partner with either other agencies or private companies or both. Um, it's definitely something that from a local government perspective, and I don't really I, I, I itemize it or pull it out, but shared services is something that is, is really going to be key moving forward, I see pulling resources together in a regional aspect and, and being able to push forward and leverage more resources towards something to make it a reality. And then being just being agile and figuring out, um, streamlining the processes that exist. Finding unnecessary approvals and maybe figuring out a way to remove those if, it's, if that helps. Um, finding a way to make sure that the customer satisfaction, the experience is there that, that, um, that, that is expected. And just really quickly, show of hands of who knows what this picture resembles. Yeah? All right, good, good. All right, I'm happy now. <laughs> it hasn't died, 2001. Um, what artificial intelligence and automation that are, that are peaking its way into, uh, into local government? We don't really see it because I think it's become so much of a part of our life in some of these instances. We don't really translate it into the government space. But it really is quite a bit around this. There's, there's, machine learning is probably um, the thing that we would see the most of as far as um, being able to collect data and have systems that learn. Um, we pretty much kind of have this thing with us all the time, whether you have uh, a, an Android device or an Apple device. There's quite a bit of machine learning that goes on just when you start to speak to your device or you're doing searches on it. Um, it's taking in all of this aggregate information and there's processes in the background that are constantly evolving and learning from, from their mistakes. Just some terms that if uh, you're ever introduced to machine learning, supervised and unsupervised, the difference is supervised means the data's been cleaned up when it comes in, the unsupervised means it just, it's a big vacuum that's sucking up anything. And then it's up to the machine to kind of learn what, what it is that's, that's coming through. Um, neural networks. All we're trying to do is recreate the way our brains work. If I ask somebody how to describe a dog, I would get an answer, and I can guarantee you I can find about 30 pictures of not dogs that that would still represent. Our brains don't work that way, and, and computer scientists are, are taking that idea of how our brains work, and they're using that, uh, they're programming to that to help um, create better learning machines. Um, some of the areas that we'll see, and I'll kind of um, talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, but um, I do want to catch this last piece here. You're going to see quite a bit of marketing material that talks about AI, it talks about machine learning, it talks about artificial intelligence, whatever it is. You have to be careful. It's, it, I shouldn't say you have to be careful, but there is, it's tough to weed out the hype from the reality. Um, there is still quite a bit of ways to go with machine learning and artificial intelligence. Facebook still employs an army of people to moderate its, its social media platform. It, and this is a company that has a ton of resources dedicated to artificial intelligence. So there is quite a bit that we don't know and that we're still working out and learning. So um, it is kind of tough because marketing people can take liberties with with things, and it's, it's tough to actually get down to what's actually happening with it. 
Obviously, citizens, as I stated in some of the earlier material, want improved search and navigation. They want to um, they want efficiencies and better online experiences. Some of the things that are available right now to local governments are, are chatbots, so the ability to be have customer service available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Having that experience of being able to ask a question and get an answer and have that system constantly learn is something that, that is available to you right now in certain platforms in certain ways. Um, workflow systems, document management systems are now employing machine learning in order to better, better um, streamline uh, taking paper into digital processes. So if I, as opposed to having to sort through documents ahead of time and then scan them in individually and then write out a whole bunch of data to describe what it is that I, that I scanned in, systems are using machine learning to read the documents and then sort it itself and figure out all of that information with it. And finally, Alexa skills. Um, a, 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 a recently, a park district is utilizing their beta testing Alexa to, um, at, so that people with the, uh, the Alexa devices can ask if their softball game is going to be on. Is that park going to be open? Um, these different things, and they're, they're utilizing that skill set uh, to be able to, the, the skill set they're creating and teaching in order to, uh, to better provide service to its customers. Um, <clears throat> diving into connectivity, there's a lot, a lot of marketing around 5G. And 5G is nothing less than awesome. It really is a cool technology. But the reality is, it's, fiber is still king. Fiber is still the dependent communication method. 5G still requires fiber and backhauls to get back to wherever it's going. The fact is, is, is um, investment in fiber is not something that's going to be a wasted effort or putting money into a deprecated uh, uh, technology. I believe it still has a very strong future moving forward. 5G is great, but it does have its limitations. It uh, does not have the same distance as, as, um, as other wireless technologies. It has much higher speeds, but now we're requiring more radios to, uh, to be able to accommodate the same thing. It's going to really help with high dense urban areas, but in the, the suburbs and the rural areas and the exurbs, it's going to be a little bit sticky. I don't know when it's going to get there, but I'm 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 not. I have a feeling it's not going to be in that immediate uh, that immediate uh, <laughs> near future. And the truth is, is uh, investment in fiber is good in the fact that um, people want to live where they want to live now. They don't necessarily want to tie themselves geographically to their jobs anymore if they don't have to. There is a push for that. In fact, right now, a study shows um, that 70% of professionals prefer that they, I'm sorry, 70% of professionals work remotely at least one day per week. So we're seeing that trend where people would like more flexibility in their lives. They need that connectivity to be able to accomplish that. Bringing that into your community is something that can be attractive and, and be able to drive in um, uh, and, and target uh, those types of uh, professional folks to be able to move into your community. And wrapping up with data privacy and ethics. Um, with the smart movement and all of the data collection, we're starting to see some of the um, questions being raised about how wise it is to collect all of this data. What are we doing with the data? What are the rule sets? That, 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 that govern how we, we manage that data. And um, I think that there's going to be a movement towards what kind of public policy can help um, determine or guide the, the organ, uh, our, our local governments in that process. We're gonna have to talk about things like, when we get the, the, the data, what do we do with it? Is there ways to monetize it? Is that the way we should be doing it? Um, should we be compartmentalizing data so that we're not putting ourselves in precarious positions by having data that might be too identifiable or might put, um, uh, put people in bad situations because of the data that's been gathered and put together? Are we drawing wrong conclusions from that data? There's, there's a lot of different ethical talks that need to happen with regards to, uh, to um, how government works with data. And with that, I'm, yeah, thank you. I have to do one question. We're running a good time, and I'll change the, the uh, <coughs> Yeah. Do we have a question from the audience? One of the 
things that jumped into my mind was when we look at technology and we look at the workforce in the city, are we going to have fewer city workers in the future as we are with, with manufacturing and other kind of things? Any thoughts about that? I either, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think that um, I, I've seen competing studies, or at least competing um, material that that states that um, there's there's um, some in, that there's ingress into larger cities, but then I'm seeing studies that show that people are willing to break away from that, and they 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 still want to be able to um, sort of live where they're they're at. I think it's it, it, it boils down to providing the necessities that that, that are required uh, in order to be productive and and hold that position and still be able to manage um, how we do things. And I think that's where the the, the technology side uh, comes into play. I think it's still on a trend of of continuing to improve within cities. Um, as far as that goes, I mean, I look at like Chicago and and with the um, the innovation districts that have been opened, and uh, the the technology that's being developed within that. That's going to be our first outlay of 5G. So that technology is 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 already in play in certain uh, pockets of the city. I think that it has that with technology, especially wireless technology, cities have its own challenges. Um, radio waves don't penetrate steel and and uh, and um, and glass it that well, they don't penetrate trees that well, and all of these things go into play in these high dense urban areas. And so um, that's why I'm sure a lot of commuters would say that they'll be driving along talking on the phone and all of a sudden they'll drop or they'll, they'll pick it up in another area. And that's just simply because of the obstacles that, that are presented. You actually have better wireless coverage in rural and more suburban areas, um, but there's a limitation to that as far as how far the distance can go. And, and those types of things. Thank you yeah. very much. Mark talked a little bit about uh, people want to work in different places and they live, telecommute, and so forth. That brings us to the idea of a regional hub and where people can actually live or live in a surrounding area, a regional hub, but actually work in a larger city. And so Dixon has really been going strong in making it just a great place to live in terms of commercial activities, other kind of things. Just to, um, this is um, something we wanted you to kind of understand. So Danny Langross is the um, city manager in Dixon, and Mike Veneer is on the council of Dixon. So let's give them a welcome. Thank you, Norman. Uh, and I'd like to, to thank the committee for uh, asking us to come and represent Dixon today. I would like to start uh, by acknowledging uh, my team members that are here, uh, Councilman Mike Veneer and Executive Director of our Dixon Chamber of Commerce and Main Street, and Jeremy England, who uh, all helped create this presentation. So when, when we think about uh, the future, uh, we need to think in terms and communities of creating the future. You know, after all, the best way to predict the future is to create it. We've got to understand these different trends, and as we talked on the calls about these trends and things that we've been seeing, this concept of telecommuting and people's willingness to commute longer distances, okay, how do you make your community relevant? How do you make your community uh, the destination where people want to raise their families, to spend time with, with their friends, and, and, and to work, but I think that economic development model is changing with technology and how mobile we become. You know, the, the standard economic development model would be, you know, create jobs and industry, and that will draw people, and then that will bring retail. Well, I think that's changing quite a bit, and we're taking advantage of that in Dixon. So, as we sat and talked, and we look at different communities that, that really have it going on and that are moving in the right direction, communities that are thriving instead of rural communities that are, that are dying. And I think that we need to look at this, especially in the rural areas, that it is thrive or die. You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. And so what are the key components of thriving communities? And so that's going to be really the focus of the presentation today. The, we see those components as leadership, strategic partnerships, 
community engagement, quality of life, recognizing and building on your strengths, and capturing momentum. Organizations and communities rise and fall with leadership. Make no mistake about it, organizations and communities rise and fall with leadership. Who you select to, to lead your organization, to lead your community, who is selected to lead the departments within those communities, and who is selected to lead those strategic partnerships to make this successful matters. We've seen this time and time again in our community. We've seen it in private organizations. We've seen it in not profits. When you think about leadership, your leadership and your leadership team not only has to have a vision, but they have to have a steadfast commitment to that vision. One of the things uh, that we think of when we think of vision is that we must begin with the end in mind, right? And the question that we begin to ask over the last year is, what is the ideal Dixon? If money wasn't an issue, if resources were not an issue, what is the ideal Dixon? What would the 88 corridor look like? What would the, the retail area around our Walmart look like? What would the anchor of our downtown and riverfront look like? What would our school district look like? Right? What would the North Business District look like? And what would our parks and recreation look like? And we've got to ask that question to see the whole picture. And we have to do this from 30,000 feet. We can't limit ourselves. In this process, we do have to dream big. Right? Because otherwise, all we do is limit ourselves and limit what our true expectation is. The second thing we need out of our leaders is a service mindset. How many people live in communities where the leaders of these organizations are more important about the term me, how does this impact me, than the we, the betterment of the entire community? And Dixon suffered for, from this for, for a long time. And there's been a huge culture shift, an identification and, and, and a recognition and a recruitment of good leaders that look at the we, that break down those silos. Because you hear concepts, and it was talked about earlier, about regionalization and, and addressing problems regionally. Well, if you can't even form partnerships in your own communities, then these regional efforts are doomed to fail. Once you have the right leadership team and the right leadership mindset and the buy-in to that, you have to create your team. You have to create your team internally and your team with those external, with those external partners. You've got to identify who the champions are within your community, right? You've got to identify those people who are hungry, who are creative, who are innovative, and who completely buy in. And then, as Jim Collins talks about getting those people on the bus, you've got to get them on the right seat of your bus. Once you do that, you begin to think about these things, envisioning and beginning with the end in mind, you've got to understand your community DNA, the makeup of your community. You have to embrace your history while creating your future. And in a lot of places get tied into this is the way it always was, so this is the way we have to do it. And, and the people who grab and hang on to that and do it for too long, those are the communities that die. We have to evolve. Organizations and communities are living things. They have a, a pulse. They are alive and they are evolving. And we've got to capture that uh, as we move forward. You cannot underestimate the, the importance of strategic partnerships. And, and this is something I could talk about for, for a long time and the way it's impacted it. But the, the one that I want to highlight is the creation of the Dixon One concept, which is now the Dixon Chamber of Commerce and Main Street. And I'll tie in later about how that impacts quality of life. But we had several organizations. We had tourism, we had Main Street, we had the Chamber, and then we had the Riverfront Commission. If you've been to Dixon, you've seen our incredible Heritage Crossing. It's really become a destination for events, uh, and, that, and I'll talk about that here in a little while. But pulling these organizations together, tearing down the silos, you know, understanding how each of those components that I just talked about work together and bringing that to life has been incredible. And then you see the importance of, of leadership 
and leading that change and bringing different boards together. And that's where Jeremy England's done such a phenomenal job in taking that to the next level. But in communities, it's not just the city, it's not just the park district or the school district, it's not just the community college, right? Um, you have to have all of these different organizations, the important organizations within your community, moving together in the right direction. If we want to take our community and continually to add layers of greatness to our great community, we have to work with in concert with these different organizations. Some government that really need to and have to be involved and in other um, you know, not-for-profits like the YMCA which is a pretty big staple in our community. And then how do you ignite those public-private partnerships? We talk a lot about leadership and partnership. So leadership plus partnership equals innovation and success. And we talked earlier um, through the presenters, and Mark talked about the increasing demand from our citizens. The fact that government is not going to be held to some different standard than private companies. And if we are not innovative, right, and we are not strategic and creative in ways to serve people and to prepare for the shift in the hipsters out into the more rural areas uh, to, to keep our millennials and generations beyond, right, we've got to be creative, we've got to be innovative, we've all got to be moving in the right direction. <laughs> That ties me to community engagement. It's exciting to see that younger people are going to the polls and voting more. But when we talk about community engagement, the, the, the foundation of, of that is building our brand. Your brand is how much people trust and have confidence in you. And if people do not have trust and confidence in your organizations, the ideas and the innovation and the progressiveness that you're trying to move forward is really futile, right? You've got to have the support of your community. And so, most recently, within the last year, we created this community group of, of proven leaders. It's called the Dixon Strong Leadership Team. And one of the first things we did with this team, it's a diverse group of professionals. There's 15 people in the group now, uh, just about an even split of men and women, diverse representative of our community. We've got people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s in this group and, and the idea was you know one what is the brand of the city currently what is the brand of the park district of the Y what's the brand of the school district and how do we create specific messages and, and specific ways to shape and create that perception uh, government does a horrible job of telling their story so we started running these tell our story campaigns and then we use this group to reach out and connect with a group of people who are really hard to connect with. You know, the newspaper and the average age of a person reading the newspaper, right, that's an older demographic. And so what we see is we have trouble getting people in their 20s, 30s, 40s even involved. And so that's been a big purpose of this group. And in two uh, surveys, the response rates have been absolutely incredible in short amount of times, and they help direct what the priorities are of this group and as we move forward. And very solidly, they were to enhance our educational achievement, to create a community rec center, and business development. That coupled, when you look at business development with the community engagement the chamber ran, shows uh, a need for, you know, people want more restaurants, more experience-based type of things. So this community engagement, driving community engagement is so important. And we talk about trust and confidence. That creates the buy-in. That's what gets people to come forward and say, I want to be part of it, I want to help. It increases your volunteerism. It also starts to create uh, new sponsors and financial contributors to the many different projects that are going on within the community, one of which I'll talk about uh, here, here in just a few minutes. You see your new and emerging leaders, then it really does uh, build and, and foster that trust to invest and to take chances of the entrepreneurs. And we have an incredible, uh, vibrant business community. Our downtown is an incredible anchor in spite of the fact that Walmart is out by the tollway. 
And so we've worked with and empowered and surrounded these entrepreneurs, uh, and it's really incredible what it is they're doing and the experience that, that they're driving. When we look at quality of life, this is something that, that's paramount. And, and you got to have the other things in place to really enhance the quality of life. There's some basic things to quality of life. You know, the low crime rate, right? That's really important. Low cost of living. When you think about telecommuting and people being willing to commute an hour to an hour and a half to work every day, if they can be in a rural community that feels like city life, right? Kind of that urban meet rural, and their dollar can go much farther, that's very appealing to people. They can still hop on the interstate and get to these other places that they want to go, but as far as the type of home they can have, you know, the opportunities they can offer to their kids, you know, and the things that they can do, it just extends that dollar, and that's a big thing. Uh, the social networks within smaller communities. You drive down the street in Dixon or walk across the street, everybody's smiling, everybody's waving. You know, people want to be part of something. People want to feel like they belong. And when you have a community culture with that sense of belonging, it's a big deal. Your social activities, employment opportunities, and then your overall education system. And then we take it kind of a step further because we've, we've worked to really increase the quality of life in Dixon, but we've also worked to become a destination. Uh, a destination for people shopping, destination for people you know, going out for a night, entertainment, uh, people who really enjoy quality food. Um, you know, just within the last couple years, through a lot of the things we've been doing, we've had three women's boutiques pop up, we've got some authentic restaurants, specialty shops, and we couple that with these events. Um, and it really creates the, the synergy moving forward to build on that, and I'll talk about momentum in, in just a couple minutes. Every community is different. Every community has different strengths. One of our greatest strengths is our downtown, the anchor of the downtown, it being located on the river, the riverfront. But we have many other, other strengths, right? Uh, we have phenomenal parks. We've got a great outdoor active lifestyle. We're, we're enhancing our trail system, but we've got a lot of great trails for walking and, and bike riding and stuff. We've got you know, our own unique history. Uh, most very good. Um, we've got incredible events. So when you think about the Dixon, 16,000 people, okay? And so we competed through what was Main Street at the time before the merger for the Mumford and Sons Gentlemen of the Road Tour. A a anybody here familiar with Mumford and Sons? So th this is a, a big time uh, band. And so they, they sought out to pick five different locations on their Gentlemen of the Road Tour. And we marketed our history, our downtown, our high school that looks like a castle, uh, the parks, and Dixon was selected to be one of the stops on the Gentlemen of the Road Tour. And for a weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, our population doubled. Just phenomenal. And so the main venue for Mumford and Sons was in Page Park, which is next to the high school along the river. But then that was really the first time that we saw the riverfront, the investment in our riverfront, um, turn into an event venue. And since then, it's propelled things like our Petunia Festival, our Blues Blues Barbecue, all these different types of events that have made Dixon a destination. Five minutes? Yeah, thank you. It's actually perfect. Uh, so that ties us in to the power of, of momentum, okay? As we're building these things and adding just layers at a time, we've got to capitalize on that momentum. We always have to ask, what is next, right? And we've got to have that engagement and that feeling of the pulse and understand the DNA. We've got to have that leadership and, and strategic partnership committed to the we as we move forward. And, and with that, we people are willing to sacrifice, really, for the greater good. And so with the creation of the Dixon Strong Leadership Team, uh, with uh, the, the naming of a new executive director of the Park District, uh, Dwayne Long, and, and the vision he had to take that district to the next level, we launched a vision to create uh, a water park splash pad. 
Um, initially, this thing started with the concept of being something smaller. But once we announced publicly and started telling our story about how these different organizations were working together and coming together, a donor called in. Two days after the articles in the paper were talking about it on the radio, a donor calls in, asks the executive director, are these partnerships for real? Is everybody working together? And he said, yeah, they're for real. We're working together, talking about other plans, and they pledged $200,000 right there. And from that, Water Wonderland was created, uh, strategically located right next to Wooden Wonderland. This is a $500,000 project to include the restroom pavilion and to include the paving of the parking lot in this area, which is known as Meadows Park. As soon as we're done with, with this in a great community kickoff event, driving tons of engagement, we announced the next vision and partnership with this group in the park district and the city and the school district and the Y and, and the college uh, for the creation of a community center. And so the community center will actually sit to the far right of the screen where the two bigger soccer fields are. And then there are, there is another 40 acres there that can be developed uh, by our school district for outdoor fields and those types of things, right? And the buzz around this as we move forward is incredible and building on and capturing that momentum is very important. So we can't just stop there. We can't get to the point where people are like, we're, we got this project and we've got to wait before we can look at the other projects. That's not how it works and that's why these partnerships are so important. While we're developing Water Wonderland, envisioning for a community center, we're actively marketing and now there's an offer on the land around the Road Ranger where there's 27 acres to be developed. And so this area here, we've already started to talk to IDOT and the tollway. We see an interchange with lights. And this area, uh, within a few years, uh, right on the interstate, is going to have additional hotels, restaurants, and fueling. Okay? And then the area uh, to what would be the south, and we're getting options on the land there and looking to grow that industrial, we've got a vibrant industrial park. Finally, the final project that we're working on right now in concert with this is called Project Viaduct Point. A few years ago, we applied for and won a $2.2 million grant to extend the bike path a mile and a half from the riverfront. It goes each direction, but it goes through this depressed area here, a former junkyard, okay, some older buildings that, that aren't in use, and then a, a company that's starting to move some operations there. This way is our incredibly vibrant downtown, riverfront, our high school sits on this side. Well, we partnered and are working with the Illinois EPA and the US EPA and Fair Graham and several other community partners. And with the vision that we have, this vision right here, which is a work in progress, the area here where the junkyard is, the United States EPA is doing four million dollars of work to remediate that to get it ready for development. So as we look at momentum and we have a vision, if we didn't have this vision, the EPA doesn't come in and spend four million dollars on this work. They probably put a fence around it, make it a, a super fun site. It sits there forever, right? So the importance of that vision, the partnerships, and, and capturing your momentum is so essential as small communities look to thrive and make themselves relevant in these changing times. So there's our contact information when you have questions. Uh, Councilman Veneer uh, is here to, to answer some of those, but you know, thank you for your time. I appreciate you coming and, and giving us the opportunity to share our story. Thank you. I'll take one question while I change the slide here. We'll move on. Right, One of the things that you didn't mention, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just well, first of all, I'm moving to this, and you spoke of it. Excellent, thank you. We'd love to have you. But second of all, when you're crafting your partnership with all of these different organizations, how do you go about it in the sense of sort of ensuring public value, right? So how are you partnering with businesses, but all, at all times sort of keeping that we as you said in mind? Yeah, so I think that I think the leaders that are taking the initiative to pull these meetings together, it's really important that they come with that value of service and the value of we. And there's a lot of community spirit in Dixon. 
And so if we, if we start with why, right, and, and, we, and we align our mission and purpose with the mission and purpose of the other leaders, and we really take the time to develop those relationships, it all becomes to flow uh, very naturally, right? Because it's founded in, in that trust and that shared vision. You have connection. The relationships begin to strengthen and develop. And then things really start to come together. And you create strong enough relationships to where when there is disagreement or there is a problem, you're able to pull it back and say, hey, remember, the foundation of this is we. The, we, we do this for the community. Nobody's here for themselves. And if you're here for yourself, then you know, you're at the wrong table, right? And nobody's going to stand up at that point and say, well, I'm, no. Um, but I think, that, I think that it's really important for the leaders, and, and, and a leader doesn't have to be a, a city manager or a council member, right? It doesn't have to be a school superintendent. Um, but it's really important for the leaders to go out and intentionally build those relationships. When we when was creating the Dixon Strong leadership team and we identified these people who were completely and totally committed to Dixon, who had shown their success through their volunteerism, through their leadership, <clears throat> the first thing I did was set up one-on-one -on -one meetings with them and ask them what was their ideal Dixon and share our vision uh, for some different things and, and made that connection. And so over really about a nine month period, these one-on-one -on -one conversations happened and then the group came together and then as a group, we started to form our priorities because we can't go into a partnership and say these are the priorities. So as a group, the first thing the group did together was take a survey that one, ranked the brand of the different organizations, but two said, what are your top three priorities? And so the group established a top three priorities, but with the underlying of community engagement and the community driving this be the most important thing, then we put out the initial survey and, and sent it to hundreds of people, had around 700 responses, and it, it's crazy, we did a good job of putting this group together because the top three priorities of the community match the top three priorities of the group. So I, I think the proactive communication, relationship building, Aligning mission and purpose are the biggest things when you're creating these strong partnerships that are built to last. Thank you. Right on target. We appreciate it very much. Our uh, third speaker is Agnes Mastin. She's Assistant Deputy Director from the Office of Regional Economic Development in DCEO. And the importance, I think, of Agnes's presentation, she's also an NI, or NIU MPA graduate, uh, Kurt, so you'll, you'll be happy about that. Um, but uh, that's not why we're invited. The, uh, the important point here is that you can't do this alone. Uh, they talked about partnerships, we talked about technology changes, a lot of these things that we can't change. So what we really have to have, to have is a regional approach. The days of every community getting its own manufacturing plant are pretty much gone. So we're thinking regionally now. And we're very, very fortunate because DCO has just come out with a new five-year regional plan. So Agnes is going to share that with you, and we'll kind of go from there. Thank you so much. So great to be back at my alma mater. I don't want to tell you how many years I've been away, but it's definitely a pleasure to, to share this room with you. Um, three words that come to mind this morning is nostalgic, I would say motivation and um, excitement. So I hope that some of the information I share inspires you and I will be here all day. So if, if, you know, if we have an opportunity to meet, I'm happy to discuss you know, projects that you're working on. Um, so what, what do I do at, at the Department of Commerce? In March, I was named Assistant Deputy Director of the Regional Economic Development Team. And part of my responsibility is to manage the business development portfolio of projects. Um, so working with companies that are looking to expand or relocate here. Um, we have the state of Illinois is um, segmented into 10 different regions, economic development regions. And I have two of my colleagues here um, from the northern state line region, John Duncan and Joe McCune from the Northeast region. So these managers um, are really the professionals that know what's happening, you know, day to day in these um, multi-county regions. So, um, our, our mission at the department is we strive to provide the best service to our customers, businesses, workers, communities by offering 
um, a mix of financial incentives, grants, and skill trainings and other programming. We help companies and employees achieve their goals. So really, uh, the department has really focused on going back to the basics and, and listening to you know, what our communities, what our customers are, are wanting and making sure that we are responsive. Uh, we just finished up, um, we're on the tail end of a listening tour. Our new director, Aaron Guthrie, um, has spent the last 10 months traveling the state with our regional team and just listening to what the needs are of the community. And so I hope to just share a little bit about that. Um, we will be going through the five-year plan. So um, thank you to NIU for the contribution to this plan. It, it has been amazing. Um, we have over 80 action items or initiatives that are um, in detail in this plan, and, and this plan is available on our website. Um, we're gonna go through today um, the first 10 months of what we've achieved um, at Commerce. We really, with the new administration, we are moving full throttle. So um, I have a lot, of, a lot of information condensed in this very short presentation, so I can easily talk on, on many of these subject matters. And then lastly, what I'd like to talk and, and hopefully achieve um, during this conversation is working together in Northern Illinois. Yes, this plan um, encompasses the full state. However, I'd like to just concentrate a little bit on that. So three of the goals that we've identified um, in this plan is reducing the equity gap. Um, we're going to be tracking um, <coughs> the average earnings uh, relative to the statewide average of the following populations, uh, women, rural residents, people of color, people with disabilities, uh, veterans, justice impacted populations and immigrants. Uh, and we really feel that, you know, just tracking our achievements by, by looking at these metrics, we hope to reduce the, the equity gap. The second goal, attracting more workers and businesses to Illinois. We're gonna be aggressively working with our partners here and in the room and marketing the state and really um, telling the story of what assets Illinois has to provide. And through that, we're gonna be um, tracking these metrics and our, and our achievements through net domestic and um, internal migration. And the second part is um, what, what really what my team and I work on is jobs creation and and investment numbers. So making sure we're tracking the workers here that, that are rotating and growing those jobs. And, and then thirdly, we'd like to um, build the foundation for long-term growth. So we're gonna be making sure we're fostering investment research and entrepreneurship and innovation. And so the following metrics that we're gonna be tracking is exports, foreign direct investment, entrepreneurship, patents, R&D spending, and worker productivity. So in this plan, we've outlined six different industries, and um, some of these are probably very familiar, and, and some of them you know, might be new to you. The agribusiness and agriculture tech, you know, that is something new that the state hasn't been focusing on, and we put that at the top of our list. Energy, information, technology, life sciences and healthcare, manufacturing or advanced manufacturing, transportation, and logistics. So what are the challenges? I know we discussed a, a few of those challenges earlier um, with, our other, with the other panelists. However, we, what we are facing and what we're hoping to achieve through this plan is um, addressing these challenges. So outward migration, um, we have um, experienced a 0.3% of over the past five years of a mild outward migration. So just a trend among young people, minorities and rural populations are experiencing that. Um, inequality, that is a very big issue that, that we don't talk about. And the African American community has experienced an unemployment rate almost double to other different um, populations. So we're probably amongst the top three communities, or excuse me, top three um, states that really, um, w that is experiencing that high rate of unemployment for, for the African American community. And really race is just a very um, big challenge in the state. So we'd like to address that. 
um, indistinct, excuse me, indist indistinct industry strengths. So um, Illinois industries, we do, do definitely have a wide range of, of industries in the state, but we haven't been very good at really marketing you know, what our industries are, and so we're gonna be addressing that. Um, lagging commercialization in R&D. Um, in our studies, we, you know, work with the sixth largest state in, in the country and the fifth largest in the economy, so, but we rank ninth in R&D, so that is something we're going to be spending, you know, more time working on that. Um, and then um, history of fiscal imbalances, that's not a new <laughs> subject matter to this group. And um, lastly, unresponsive bureaucracy. So we're definitely trying to use our mission to help change that. <laughs> Items that we've addressed in the first 10 months, I'm not gonna go through this, this full list, but the governor has announced a $45 billion um, investment into um, areas like technology, but mostly into infrastructure and calling it Rebuild Illinois. So we've already, um, we've already um, issued our first grants for OMI, and, excuse me, and so that was $15 billion, or excuse me, million, that was a big mistake there, $15 million, and it's going to be investing into incubators and small businesses, so hoping to spur, um, you know, addressing some of the challenges that we discussed. Um, thirdly, um, I think the university would like this, increasing the monetary award program, the MAP, the MAP program. Um, we've had, we passed legislation for data centers, and so we've been recruiting, and we recently worked on two large projects to um, increase investments into data centers, so large investments and hoping, hoping that, you know, we're going to be having some really good announcements coming in the near future for Northern Illinois for, for data centers. Um, the apprenticeship tax credit, um, that is a new program that will be starting in the beginning of um, January of 2020. Uh, we will be taking um, applications. It's a $5 million um, bucket. So companies that have registered apprenticeship programs, federally registered apprenticeship programs can apply for a $3,500 tax credit um, that would be um, to help with the educational costs of these apprentices. Um, so once that's once that bucket's taken up, the the tax credit, um, will you'll have to reply for the next year. But we're really excited to announce that. Um, Blue Collar Jobs Act that's going to be on the horizon. So you'll see um, when companies are investing and in, in creating um, new projects that there's going to be an incentive for um, you know hiring and and making sure that we're um, building you know you know, putting more investment into infrastructure. So that's gonna be coming out in two years, but we did pass that. We extended the R&D tax credit. That's a program that, you know, many people don't realize that yes, the federal government offers um, incentives for that, but the state, we do mirror that. And so the governor felt it was important to extend that. Um, and then I'm, I'm gonna just, we can talk more of the, these things one-on-one. -on -one. So um, three of, I mean, for, for the way we're going to be working with the regional team, um, just regional coordination, we've spent the last um, 10 months listening, surveying, and, and really outlining how are we going to be strategically working with partners. So the capital strategy, um, out of that $45 billion in invest, or, excuse me, in rebuild Illinois, um, Department of Commerce has two billion dollars that's dedicated to economic development. So one billion um, of the capital strategy is going to be going into public infrastructure and community development grants. Um, 425 million um, for economic development projects, 112 for education and science facilities. You're going to see 50 million for emerging technology. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we discussed here, you know, I, I look forward to seeing what those buckets are going to look like. Um, and then 400 million for broadband deployment. So um, I know that a big focus is how are we going to be working, you know, with our regional hubs. Um, our managers are going to be working with institutions like NIU, and we're going to be coordinating meetings and making sure 
that we're talking about the subjects in the economic plan and finding ways to be innovative and how are we going to be implementing you know, these 80 different um, criteria or goals that we want to achieve. So I'm gonna just you know, talk about a subject matter um, for advanced manufacturing and just show the potential of how do we look at the regions and what they provide and, and what like the communities like Dixon have said, how they work together, how can we do that um, on a statewide scale? And then, oops, I really went too far. Okay, I need the clicker. Oops. Okay, there will be um, a very big push for broadband. We just hired um, the director of our broadband um, bureau, and so we are de developing ways of how are we gonna be funding um, broadband deployment. So whether it's going to be for communities, for businesses, so that's gonna be, you're gonna see grants coming out for that. And then finally, workforce development. Um, probably the, one of the most in, important um, topics here, um, we have invested, like I said, in the apprenticeship tax credit. We currently have a grant opportunity out there for um, apprenticeship um, coordination, and um, really what we're gonna be focusing on is how are we gonna be training our future workforce you know, to address these emerging technologies, and, and, and also a big concern is just succession planning, making sure that people you know, who are experienced um, you know, managers and engineers, especially in our rural communities, just making sure that there is that, you know, that training, that succession planning, and, and that companies are going to stay here and not necessarily get bought out. So three of the different, I'm going to highlight the, the top three regions in the state. Um, some of these industries um, in the state are part of our, um, our or what we would say is our top top industries. However, um, for Joe, he represents the North um, Northeast region, and so the top industry clusters that we are working through, I would say um, manufacturing is one, but we have it listed here as food processing. Um, we would say um, transportation and logistics, fintech, um, definitely um, an emerging industry, and life sciences. Um, when we surveyed our local areas, we identified um, through what people have told us, like what are they, what are they looking for? So funding for business support programs, funding for workforce training. Um, actually, the third one on the list is approval times for just our enterprise zone credits. So making sure that we're processing, um, doing our work here at Commerce. Um, and then infrastructure funding, which we've addressed. And so some of the infrastructure buckets that we're looking to work through um, are different parts of the capital bill, but you're going to be seeing um, not just in um, the department, but I mean, what am I trying to say? You're gonna be um, seeing in the first quarter of the year, we're going to be starting to issue these grant opportunities. So um, to, to to talk about those capital solutions. Um, other, other items in the statewide plan not exclusive to the North um, East region is working with companies interested in developing innovative transportation projects such as autonomous fleets, working on policies to adjust emerging technologies, uh, making big investments in transportation infrastructure through Rebuild Illinois, and convening a transportation technology summit to tackle the challenge of getting small and mid-sized transportation companies the technologies they need to grow. So the northern state line region, um, you know, I, I think just being, coming from the northeast and, and not knowing much about the northern state line region, um, I think with, when you look at industries, many of these key industries have like a two um, location quotient. So they're actually, when you compare it to national numbers, they're actually, you know, have expertise and concentration double that of, na of, of, of the national numbers. So what we're known for, food processing, automotive manufacturing, um, aerospace, what our communities have said to us, 
There's a need for workforce development, business retention, and modernizing infrastructure. So we're hoping to address that with those two solutions, but not exclusive to that, um, for emerging technology and scientific education and facility, facility funding, excuse me. Um, some of the other items um, in the plan that you know that I see for the Northern State Line region, expanding the awareness of foreign trade zones, uh, starting teacher corps among retired manufacturing workers and managers, providing grants and loans to companies that seek to acquire and rehabilitate sites um, and facilities for R&D. And um, I love this one, encouraging universities to set up um, programs where business schools help researchers and universities commercialize their research. Okay, and lastly, the Northwest region. Um, some of the uh, top industries, agriculture, uh, machinery ma manufacturing, I think that's probably what I know th them best for. Um, automotive manufacturing, tourism, retail, and defense. Um, what the communities have told us, there's a need for infrastructure, business support, workforce development, and um, business retention. Um, so one of some of the items that I see um, expanding broadband to underserved and um, uh, excuse me underserved areas and convening an ag tech summit and providing agric agricultural innovation vouchers to families, um, Illinois farmers, um, excuse me, to help Illinois farmers transition um, in demand crops and implement renewable farming methods and adopting new technologies. So how are we going to, um, you know, work through these regional, re with, with these regional hubs? I think the, the best example that comes to mind um, of like how can we best market is is working with organizations like the Rockford Area Aerospace Network. Um, in Rockford, they have over four tier one suppliers um, working with, excuse me, four tier one aerospace companies working with over 250 suppliers within a 90 minute radius. Um, so, you know, how do we make sure that we're connecting these communities and working and making sure that they are aware of the Illinois supply chain, especially in northern Illinois? Um, and the other thing about aerospace, I think it's, it's the sixth largest concentration of employment um, in the U.S. here in aerospace in northern Illinois, so that's a great story to tell. And um, just so much... Um, so much opportunity for us to you know to to spread that word. Um, we're going to be using topics like this and, and working with our regional economic development team to just you know what are what are the different assets that our that our hubs have, especially in northern Illinois. And so I'll walk you through the um, the food processing in northern Illinois. So right now, um, illustrated on these in these four counties. Uh, we have 68 companies that, you know, consider themselves as food processors. Um, they, you know, there's an opportunity for us to, you know, to work with these companies, have conversations, and, and really just build a network around them. Um, 30 of these companies are showing um, signs of financial growth. So they're, they are primed to be growing. So for us to be good stewards, um, you know, in the community, it's making sure that these com these companies, you know, have the the tools that they need to to stay here and grow here. So I think, you know, those are those are opportunities for us to work together. Um, and the average wage for some of these employees, especially in in these three counties, um, in this particular industry, seventy one thousand dollars. Like I think that when, you know. When, it, when I was younger, you know, we didn't know much about the manufacturing industry and, and what, you know, the potential it would be to, to work in a great industry um, like that. And here is just by um, employment, by how many employees there are in the different um, communities. Um, what I was interested when I looked at this data is that the places where they had less employees, they were actually paying more. So, you know, there are opportunities for good paying jobs in our in our area, and so we need to make sure that, that we're telling that story. So, 
So I asked, you know, I know I mentioned some of our, our challenges and what our goals are and, and really just going through, you know, what our assets or what our assets are in, in our top three regions of the state. And I really, you know, challenge you to just to think big. And so some of the goals that I hope we can work together on is just um, rural community revitalization, um, increasing investment into communities of color, making sure that we retain our young talent, and um, connecting the Illinois startup ecosystem. You know, I, I was I was shocked when I knew that there's, you know, that like hundreds of incubators that are out there. So making sure that, you know, that the people, the the new um, technology that that's starting here, that we make sure that we have a, a good um, community to help nurture and, and grow these companies. Um, we want to treat prospective businesses like valued customers. So I hope that you see that um, in commerce that there definitely is you know, a way to um, provide um, customer service um, in, in government. And then um, lastly is deliver end-to-end -end career services. So, you know, working with our communities, our workforce partners, making sure that our, um, the, the people that are, you know, going to our grade schools, our high schools, um, that they, you know, stay and choose Illinois as a community to raise their families. So, so thank you again, Norm. Um, my contact information is on the slide, but happy to talk to you, to any of the one of you throughout the day. So take care. Why don't we take one question uh, for Agnes now, and then uh, we're going to be pretty close to lunch. So you're, I think people will stay here for a while if you want, or you can meet with them informally or the rest of the day. But is there a question that? Um, you have out there? Yes. I just want to know what is the now new relationship between DTO and Intersect Illinois? Great. Oh, excuse me. Great question. Um, so, I, you know, Intersect Illinois um, is our state um, public private partner. So, what they've done in the past few years is, is they have been responsible for helping us attract new um, companies. Uh, we, um, as a state or our, our team, um, mostly the business development and economic development team, uh, we are working um, weekly on them, on our pipeline. So, so you're going to see um, probably a stronger relationship um, in terms of we're going to be using them as an arm to help market our state um, on a nationwide basis and, obvious, and obviously working on foreign direct investment. So, um, you know, that relationship is there. Um, we're hoping to strengthen it, and I think you're going to see some, some new leadership there as well. We're uh, right close to lunch, so on your way out, if you would, um, you can leave your cards. Uh, CGS is pretty serious about looking to the future, so we'd like to know how we can help. We'd like to know what you think themes are. We will, in fact, tabulate them, even give you some results back today, but you will get the results back of what the people collectively are thinking as a region. And I think we're pretty serious about that. On a more local level, I'm hoping that throughout the day, you'll use those strategic doing uh, action plans, make notes, kinds of things that you want to do about from this session or any of the other sessions, so that when you get home and tomorrow morning, you can say, okay, what can I do? What do I want to accomplish? Who can help me do it? When do we want to do it? That kind of an approach. And then finally, we want to say thank you for uh, panelists for making presentations and so we've got a little token of our uh, appreciation. Okay. Thank you. So feel free to stay around and, and the panelists will be happy to talk to you I'm sure so talk to you later.